we need our soul to save. You would turn with me over to Acts chapter 27. I'm going to do a teaching called Shaking Off the Snakes. Because we all have snakes that try to slither into our life. And sometimes they succeed in biting us and their venom goes into us. And if we're not quite cautious, they'll kill us. And in Acts chapter 27, because actually Paul went through, I tell you what, if you ever look at the life of Paul, he goes from preaching to a trial, preaching the gospel to a trial, preaching the gospel to a trial. And sometimes as Christians, you and I, we do the same thing. Life is has its ups and downs, and Satan will try and knock you out of the ball game, and you'll go through the trial, and then there will be a valley, or a valley, and then there will be a mountaintop, and then there will be a valley. And many times people think when they're on the mountaintop, that's a great time because, you know, I'm above it. But Jesus says, prisoner is not on the boat to go. And Paul warned them. Paul says, don't go now. Okay, the, the weather is going to be tumultuous. It's going to be bad. And I'm just warning you, the Lord told me for you not to go. And so he admonished them. But in verse 13 of that chapter, it says, And when the soft wind blew, when the south wind blew softly. See, many times conditions look favorable. And even though you're told not to go or do something by the Lord, you'll do it because everything looks good. So when the south wind blew softly in verse 13, then came the tumultuous wind, and actually at that point it took the ship. And it was caught, and it couldn't bear up. And it goes on in verse 17. Which when they had taken up, they used house, undergirding the ships, and fearing, lest they should fall into the quicksands. And we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lighted the ship. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when the sun nor stars in many days appear, no, no small tempest lay on us, and all hope that we should be saved was taken away. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained this harm and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you but only of the ship. For there stood by me the slain, an angel of, the, of God, to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore take heart, men, for I believe that it is, it will be just as it was told. So here Paul's given a promise. He has to go before Caesar. Here this wind and this storm and this hurricane is coming. And it looks like they're going to all perish and die. But Paul knew something. Paul told him, look, you're going to go to Caesar. How many of you know if God says you're going to go somewhere, you're going to go somewhere no matter what storm tries to come against you? And he told him there, he said, hey, look, guys, listen, 276 prisoners, take heart. I'm telling you, God told me we're going to the other side. 2741, but striking a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and the prow stuck fast and remained immovable. But the stern was being broken up by the violence of the winds. And the soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners. Now catch this. The soldiers' plans were to kill the prisoners, lest any of them should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wanting to save Paul, kept, kept them for their purpose. Do you know why the centurion wanted to save Paul? Because Paul had a purpose and a promise to get to Rome before Caesar. But the key here is if the centurion saved them, his very life was on the line, and he was up for consequences of being killed himself. And Agrippa told him that, and he said, hey, look, 
But the centurion says, I'm going to do it. I'm going to save Paul. He was being used by God to save Paul so Paul can make his destination to Rome to stand before Caesar. So God is always working in ways that we don't even see how he's working through the centurion, through the unbeliever, through the native, whoever it is. And here he goes on and he says, and commanded that those who could swim first and get to land. And the rest, some on boards and some on parts of the ship. And so it was that they all escaped safely to land. I'm going to talk to you about the shaking off the snakes in verse 2 of Acts. And the native showed us unusual kindness. Now here you got to understand, they made it to the other side. They're at a place called Malta, and it's a, the Viper uh, came and there it is up there, okay? The picture of a Viper with the fangs, and I don't know if you can see it real good, but with its mouth open, and you can see the fangs there, that was the Viper. It wasn't just Viper is one of the most venomous, biggest snakes there are. So this is what latched on Paul's hands was his viper, his hand. So here you go. He's got this viper. When he went to pick up the snakes, he, you understand, you have to understand is snakes will lie dormant in any in place because when it's cold and rainy, they don't go anywhere. But as soon as there's heat, it raises them up to a place where they're not there now going to do what they need to do. And in this case, it was looking for food. And Paul was the perfect opportunity for the food of a viper. But even at that point, there's no, nothing poisonous yet for it to come out. As soon as he started trying to get it off, the jaws and the, the section of its mouth at that point start going back and forth and injecting the venom into his hand. And so at this point in time, you gotta understand, this snake that he's facing, this snake that is putting venom into his hand, is coming to a place, and here's the crisis. He did it because Satan's gonna come in your life, and how is he doing good? He was helping the team, and he was helping those with the sticks to start the fire. He didn't just watch those barbarians and natives put the sticks in. He himself got right into it. The crisis came because he was working. How many times do you and I work? How many times do you and I do good things but say home? Uh, I, I like a second of you. Besides work, there are times you get so wounded by a snake that the next time you come in church, for you to worship God becomes very difficult. There's a hurt, there's a pain, there's venom that goes into your hand. So to worship God becomes very difficult for you as a Christian. And the other thing that the, the third W I want to say is writing. As an individual, you think about the Apostle Paul. That venom went into his hand. If he didn't shake off the snake, Creature into the fire and suffered no harm. You see, they believed in those days that if a snake bit you, they assumed that because the snake bit you, you did something evil in your life. And so because you were doing something evil in your life, you were being punished. And the second snake will rehearse it. You're going to disperse it. Because many are going to be defiled because that venom is still in you and it needs to come out. So they did. They looked for a long time. They were cynical. They looked for nothing good to come of this situation. I want to ask you, have you ever dealt with somebody being cynical in your life? Have you ever come to a place with cynical words? Words like, you'll never make it. Just church thing won't work. Have, have you ever, when you got saved, did anybody say, oh, he's going through another phase, this isn't going to really work for him. It's just something that just come along. Cynical words. 
Now you can shake it off, that snake of cynicism off, or you can say, well, maybe it won't. Or did anybody ever say to you, you know, you're going to fail, you're going to fall, this stuff isn't really real. You see, some people are just waiting for you to fall and fail. And if you're not careful, you'll even prophesy yourself. You may come to a place in your life where you, maybe the Lord told you to do something, or, or maybe something in your life you're attempting to do and you don't get done, and you may say out of your mouth, I have, what's the use? I might as well quit. This stuff doesn't work. I can't believe it. What am I going to do? And you're being your own sin. And you're criticizing yourself. And you're condemning yourself. Instead of saying, Thomas Edison attempted to make the light bulb, and I don't know if it was 10,000 times, the 10,000 and one, or 1,000 times, the 1,000 first one, he actually made it. He could have said after the first or second one, you know, I've tried once, I've tried twice, this stuff doesn't work, I'm going to quit it. But no, he kept persevering. Yeah. He kept going on. Nothing was going to stop him. Saints, nothing should stop you. You ought to be staying on with the staying on. Quitters never fail. Quitters never fail. But you know what? Failures quit. And I'm here to tell you this. You and I need to say, hey, look, I'm not going to be my own cynic. I'm not going to listen to the cynical words of other people. I'm not going to do this because I know if there's any way I'm going to get to Rome, it's going to have to be where I keep on and keep an eye. Why? He shook off the snake of crisis. He shook off the snake of crit critical. He shook off the snake of cynical people. Eliab, when David was going to go out, Eliab, his oldest brother, said to him, he was aroused against David and he said, David, why did you come down here? And Saul said to David, you are not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he but a man of war from his youth. And I tell you what, Eliab and Saul both had cynical words. They criticized David. The best way I've said to answer your cynics is to keep, keep succeeding, is to keep going. <clears throat> Paul remembered the promise. In, in verse 9, 28, verse 9, when Paul shook off, off those three snakes, the reason he did that you look at verse 7. In that region there was an estate of the leading citizen of the island, whose name was Publius, who received us and entertained us courteously for three days. So here you have the mayor of the island. He received Paul. He entertained Paul. He let Paul in. And, and uh, the barbarians actually treated him them with kindness. But if you notice in verse 7, Publius's father was sick. And it happened that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. But Paul went into him and prayed. Now look what he prayed. And he laid his, say it, saints, hand on him. Why am I saying him? Him. Well, where was Paul wounded? Where was Paul bent? In the hand. And the very thing that was wounded was the very thing that God used to bring healing to Publius' father. I'm here to say to you, some of you have wounds and you have hidden them. Jim, what you here for? Jim, yeah. Just want to use so here's Paul's coming up to Paulus's father and lays his hand on him. Now what Paul could have done was, you know what, my wound's going to show. Well, you know what, people are going to see the wounds, so I better not lay hands. But you know what, Paul didn't care what it looked like. Paul didn't care what the teeth marks. Paul did not care 
that very wound actually he was used to bring healing upon yeah. the Jesus. And I, I'm here to tell you this, the very area in your life that you've been wounded, if you deal with the venom, some of you can, cannot or won't be used because you won't deal with the wound that God wants to use to bring healing to somebody else. And that's the only way Paul kept going. He kept shaking off every single snake. Paul changed a crisis into an opportunity. He then realized, now if you think of this, he went from the shipwreck to the snake bite. See, God had a plan. He, God used Paul to bring him through the shipwreck and the snake bites to bring healing to a man. God will use you come hell or high water to get to somebody so that God can use you to bring healing to somebody that needs healing. But you have to go through the wounds. And when the venom bites you and the hurt and the criticism and the cynics come against you, you need to shake it off so that God can keep you. moving you and going you in a direction to bring you to a place where there's a yeah. need in somebody else's life. Yeah. This is awesome. Verse 9, he laid hands on him and healed him. Look at this. These were all natives and barbarians who never heard of Jesus. Verse 9. So when this was done, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were healed. There was revival because they shook off the snakes. You want revival in your life and in the city of Buffalo, you got to turn a crisis into an opportunity. You got to turn a promise into a destiny. Where there's an attack of the enemy and the snake, that's an opportunity. And when you and I realize this, this hand was the hand that was bit by the viper. The enemy attacks that the area that God wants to use you the most. And he'll come against you in your mind, but I'm going to tell you what. Paul, hospitality was given by Publius, and you know what? Because Publius sowed hospitality to Paul and honored the man of God here, and I catch this, God used Paul to heal his father. When you sow goodness, when you sow mercy, when you sow good, God is going to say, hey, you know what? I don't care. You're a vessel. Don't think it's going to be you or the one that's going to get the job done. You just deal with the snakes in your life so God can deal with and use you. So he shook off the crisis. I want to show you an individual on a clip here that shook off a crisis. I was moved by this. He shook off a crisis, shook off criticism, shook off cynical people, and what you're about to see
They was like, let's take some blood work and we'll be back. The doctors came in, said, yeah, he does have cancer. And um, it was the worst day of my life. The doctors treated me with chemotherapy. When I lost my hair, I was really sad and embarrassed at the same time to go to school. They used to make fun of me and laugh at me because I was different. They would spread rumors to say that um, my cancer was contagious and they all wanted to stay away from me. One day, Tyler saw a flyer at his school and it said, after school program, free violin lessons. He's like, Mom, I want to do it. Mom, I want to do it. I was like, but no one in our family plays an instrument. What in the violin? I would just practice in my bedroom and the more I did it, the better I got. Once he started that class, it was like a sunshine. He was just full of energy, the happy. I was like, oh my God, I got my son back. When I play the violin, it helps me forget about all the bad stuff. I just didn't want to be the kid with cancer. So now I'm the kid who plays the violin.
Lay hands on the sick and they'll be healed. I'm going to tell you, if you're here and you have wounds that need to be dealt with and you have areas in your life, maybe it's toxic thinking, maybe it's addiction, maybe it's bitterness. I'm here to tell you, if you just come forward um, and empty your heart before the Lord. He'll take it. He's here to bear your burden. If not, do it at a time in your prayer time and know this. God will turn you into a vessel meat for the master use. He'll use you to do mighty works. And people will see a Christ that's alive. And just like Paul, healed one person and the whole island came to God here. You can make an impact on one person like the woman at the well went back and told the whole city and the whole city was revived and evangelized and got saved. Are you willing to do that in your life? Do you want to do that in your life? Stand up. We're going to pray. Pray this prayer with me. Search me, O Lord. Search me, O Lord. See my ways. Look at my thoughts. And if there be any hurtful way in me, lead me into the way everlasting. Because I want to be used. And I want any wounds that are hindering me to be utilized and turned around. And that weakness be turned to strength to minister to others and see the gospel spread in Jesus' name.